This is the second video on heart development in this series. If you haven't watched the first one, I'd go back and watch that one first. We're moving on now to focus on what happens to this newly formed embryonic heart from the fourth week of development onwards. So here's this embryonic heart tube, which has already developed a series of bulges. It has an atrium, which receives the sinus venosus where major veins enter the heart. Above that, we've got the atrium, then the ventricle, then bulbous cordis leading up to the aortic roots. And in week four, what happens is a twist. It's called the cardiac loop. And the bulbous cordis moves down ventrally and to the right, while the atrium tucks up behind the ventricle and moves over to the left. So this cardiac loop brings those chambers into a position where the heart starts to look a lot more familiar now. It's not just a tube with a series of chambers in a row. Although, of course, at the moment, those chambers are in a row. They're just twisted around. Let's have a look at the context of that heart then. It's attached via a whole series of aortic arches, actually, to dorsal aorta, which lower down, fuse together to make a single aorta. And that heart is lying in a pericardial bulge just under the embryo's head and you can see the aorta traveling down the back of the embryo. Drawing it in context like this also means that we remember how tiny the embryo is at this point when the heart is forming and already beating. It's only just starting to think about growing some arms and legs as you can see by these limb buds and the embryo is about four millimeters long from its head to its tail at this point. There are those aortic arches, look, they're labelled 1, 2, 3, 4 and 6. It's not because embryologists can't count, it's because arch 5 is vestigial. We see slight indications of it and then it disappears, but we know from studying other animals that our ancestors once had a fifth aortic arch, but then it did disappear along our evolutionary journey. Now I'm going to draw this embryo's heart from the front with the blood vessels attached to the top of it there. So those are the aortic arches attaching to those aorta. And we're looking at this heart just as we get into the fifth week of development. There are the aortic arches, one, two, three, four, and six. And only one of those will be retained as the aortic arch, which is in fact the fourth arch on the left. But the others do stick around to become parts of blood vessels in the head and the neck. Now let's have a look at those chambers of the heart itself. There's bulbous cordis, that's over on the right. Remember, we're looking at a frontal view, the anterior aspect of this heart. And so what appears on the left of the image is on the right of the embryo. Bulbous cordis is divided up into three sections now. So truncus arteriosus at the top, which is the precursor of both the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. Conus cordis, which is the middle third of bulbous cordis, that's going to be the outflow tracts of both ventricles. So the right ventricle's outflow tract leading up to the pulmonary trunk and the left ventricle's outflow leading up towards the aorta. And then the lowest third of bulbous cordis is the primitive right ventricle. So we're starting to see some definitive heart anatomy beginning to emerge. Over on the left hand side, the primitive ventricle of the heart tube is now the primitive left ventricle. And from that original common primitive atrium, we've now got a right atrium and a left atrium, although at the moment they are incompletely divided. Now what I want to do is open up the front of this heart and see what's going on inside. So you've got to imagine that we have just sliced the front of that heart away. And we can see that some of it is quite smooth walled on the inside, but then we can see that it becomes rough walled in the ventricle. So we've got the beginning of trabeculated muscle growing inside those ventricles. There's the atrioventricular canal. So that's the opening from the atria into the ventricles. And at the moment, that is just a single opening. Eventually, it will get divided up into a right channel and a left channel, framing what will eventually be the tricuspid and the mitral valves. I'm just adding a bit more detail to those trabeculae on the insides of the ventricles, but notice that the conus cordis is quite smooth-walled still, and that will remain into adulthood. 
Oh, look at this. Some of the muscle there is growing up to form a ridge. So this is the muscular interventricular septum that we're starting to see there. And this eventually is going to contribute to the two ventricles becoming completely divided from each other. This is the direction of blood through this heart at this point. So it's flowing from the atria into the ventricles and then up into that wide open outflow tract of the truncus arteriosus. Now I want you to imagine that we're going to cut through this heart towards the back. So there we go, we've just grazed through the back of the ventricles, we've lost the rest of the ventricles, we've lost the outflow tract, we can take away those arteries. We're getting a really good view now of the inside of the atria. You can see the primitive left atrium and primitive right atrium and you can see the sinoatrial orifice, that's where the sinus venosus is emptying blood into the right atrium. What we can also see in that atrioventricular canal between the atria and the ventricles is that there's a bulge appearing, that's the endocardial cushion, and there's a pair of these on either side. They push towards each other within that atrioventricular canal and eventually they meet. They form a septum, a division. So we've now got a right and a left atrioventricular canal but the atria are still wide open in communication with each other. So the next thing that happens is we start to get a series of partitions beginning to grow. The first one is called septum primum, the first septum, and that's growing down from the ceiling of that primitive atrium. The hole underneath it, or the gap underneath it, is known as the first hole, ostium primum. And this is all happening in the fifth week of development. We're just starting to get another septum appearing, growing down from the ceiling of the atrium. And this one is the second septum, or septum secundum. So you can see that's growing down on the right-hand side. Remember that we're looking at this heart from the front, growing down on the right-hand side of septum primum. Septum primum is almost reaching down to the endocardial cushions now, but it can't go down all the way, otherwise we'd lose a connection between the right and the left atrium. So we start to get lots of little holes appearing at the top of it, and eventually those holes will coalesce and form a gap, and that gap is the ostium secundum, the second hole. As septum secundum grows down towards the endocardial cushions, it ends up with this oval hole underneath it, and that oval hole is called the oval hole, but of course we translate everything into Latin or Greek, so it's called foramen ovale. And these holes are really important because they mean that the oxygenated blood, which in the embryo is entering the right side of the heart, can flow over into the left side to get pumped out into the systemic circulation. If we look at that back wall of the right atrium, we can see that sinus venosus has become absorbed into that back wall until We've got separate openings now of the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava. There's the superior vena cava just sticking out the top. I'll label them up SVC, IVC. And it's the inferior vena cava that brings the oxygenated blood to this heart. So that oxygenated blood flows up through the inferior vena cava, straight through foramen ovale, through ostium secundum and over into the left atrium then it gets pumped down into the left ventricle and up into the outflow tract. This rather complicated septation, this partial division of the left atrium from the right atrium, seems somehow overly complicated, but it's extremely clever because it achieves the possibility of bringing that oxygenated blood into the right-hand side of the heart in the embryo and shunting it over to the left, which is what needs to happen, whilst at the same time, meaning that you've got a system of valves that can shut when the baby's born and seal off the left atrium from the right atrium once the lungs start to work because the blood from the lungs will be returning to that left atrium. So it's anticipating what needs to happen in that heart at the moment of birth. Let's just focus again for a minute on that lump of tissue in the middle of the atrioventricular canal because that is contributing to the development of the valves that lie between the atria and the ventricles, the valves that will be the mitral valve on the left and the tricuspid on the right. And I'm going to colour that tissue in a greenish colour. And right in the centre it's growing 
down to meet the muscular interventricular septum and it's going to form a more sheet-like membranous part of the interventricular septum. Before we take a look at what's going on in those ventricles in a bit more detail, I just want to have another go at drawing these septa that form between the right and the left atrium. I always think it's good to look at a few different diagrams to try to get your head around exactly what's going on. And as this septation is quite complicated, I just thought I'd draw it where we can see the septa a bit more completely, still with the atria obviously cut open so we can see inside them. If we label up what's going on here, we're still looking at an anterior view. So septum primum is there and septum secundum is on the right hand side of it. There's the IVC through which the oxygenated blood is flowing and that's going to go through foramen ovale, through ostium secundum and over into the left atrium. So there's the arrow showing that lovely oxygenated blood. And you can see perhaps a little better in this diagram how at the moment of birth when you end up with blood rushing into the left atrium you're going to get these two septa pressed together and they'll seal off the right from the left because the holes are staggered. We've also got blood coming in from the SVC and that's deoxygenated blood returning from the head and neck to the heart and I never really could understand why that didn't just completely mix up with all the blood coming in through the IVC until actually I looked at a newborn lamb's heart so unfortunately obviously a lamb that, that didn't make it but I used to work at the anatomy department in the University of Bristol where we taught vets as well as medics so I got to see some comparative anatomy I was looking at this lamb heart and I, I looked at this tiny heart and, and up through the IVC and found that I was looking directly at foramen ovale, shining a little light into it. And then I turned it round and looked down the SVC and found that I was looking straight down into the right ventricle. And those two flows of blood are separated from each other front to back, which in a diagram like this is hard to show you. It just looks like the two flows of blood are going to crash into each other and mix up. But they're separated front to back and there really is little mixing between those two flows of blood going through the right side of the heart and the foetus. Finally, in this video, I want to have a look inside those ventricles again. So I'm going to return back to this embryonic heart and you can see that I've shown it opened up so we've taken a slice off the front of it so we can see into the right ventricle we're glimpsing a bit of the left ventricle and we can see that outflow tract conus cordis which is heading up towards truncus arteriosus now obviously this is all going to have to get divided up and we start to see a couple of ridges forming within truncus arteriosus and conus cordis so a pair of ridges that grow out towards each other and eventually fuse in the midline to form a complete septum but this septum is spiraling so I'm going to try and show you that and add a bit of shading so you can imagine how that septum forms those ridges grow out towards each other in a spiraling fashion and eventually the conotruncal ridges fuse to form the conotruncal septum and you can see the way that's spiraling round there's our muscular interventricular septum growing up to separate the bases of those two ventricles from each other. And we can see through into the atria just behind that. You can see the conotruncal septum starting to grow down towards the muscular interventricular septum. And then in fact, the final divider between the ventricles is that membranous interventricular septum. So we've got a contribution to the interventricular septum from the conotruncal septum growing down from the endocardial cushions producing a bit of that membranous part of the interventricular septum and from the muscle itself. And here's a stream of blood which is coming from the right atrium, it's passing through the right ventricle up into the pulmonary channel. That will eventually be the pulmonary trunk. And on the other side, we've got blood that's come from the left ventricle and that's spiraling round the pulmonary channel in the aortic channel headed for the ascending aorta. When we look at the front of an adult heart, we see those two vessels spiraling around each other. And that's all set up by this spiraling septation of truncus arteriosus and conus cordis in the embryo.
in the next video I'm going to look at where all that blood goes. I'm going to look at the fetal circulation in more detail, connect that up with the umbilical vessels and find out how that embryo circulation is also going to change at the moment of birth. So I hope you'll rejoin me then for the next instalment of Lockdown Embryology. Please like, please share, please subscribe to this YouTube channel and I'll see you next time for a bit more cardiovascular embryology. Thank you very much for watching.